and the future outlook. Uh, my name is Jan Hrushak and together with John Womersley, uh, we are uh, co-chairing uh, this uh, landscaping working group of the EOS Executive Board. In view of the fact that we just have had our validation workshop where we have been presenting uh, the landscaping report to broader public and there is a strong overlap in audience. Uh, it is a little bit tricky to design uh, the breakout session of today and uh, therefore we des decided to go a bit different way than, than the others and you see the outline here. So I have, will have a very brief presentation on uh, the, the main main uh, results of the working group uh, which are collected together in the, in the report. Uh, we will have a short overview of the inputs which we gathered by the validation workshop. Then uh, John will start the discussion on our uh, future outlook and will we'll, we'll present some thoughts we have developed in this direction. And uh, finally, we have the pleasure to have with us uh, Joy Davidson from the uh, Digital Collation Center, uh, which is a company that uh, will help us to design the remaining part of, of the report. We will have a discussion with you where we prepared some uh, guiding questions. So in a usual way, please use Slido to respond and John will uh, close this session with some remarks in the end. Uh, this is uh, again just a very brief reminder that the working group landscape uh, consists of 23 members, is chaired by, by John and me. These members were nominated solely by the member states because the, the group is working on a bit a sensitive issue, namely uh, on, on the inputs and, and evaluation of, of the member states' potential contributions to EOS, and therefore we saw this restricted format is appropriate. Uh, just to remember, we have been asked to deliver uh, on uh, relevant national infrastructures, which is done already by the, by the existing uh, landscape report. We had to take stock of the federation constraints and opportunities, uh, which is partially done in, in the report and we have to propose mechanisms and best practices that will facilitate convergence and alignment. Uh, this is uh, still still under development, but uh, the, the, the main ideas already collected in the report. What remains to be done is an analytical part of, of, the, of the report where we shall somehow comment on the uh, preparedness of member states for the EOS Association. This slide shows essentially the same. We are working in an iterative way because we, we, we believe that uh, this uh, landscaping report shall be to a most possible extent remain dynamic. So it's a statical uh, report and therefore in an iterative way we are always uh, reconsidering all the chapters and at the moment we have finalized and have discussed with the major stakeholders the second edition of this of this uh, sorry the third edition of this of this report and we are on the way for finalizing it completing it by the landscape analysis which essentially shall uh, contain uh, national approaches to EOS and as said, try to comment on the preparedness of member states and associated countries for the EOS uh, implementation. Uh, this this is essentially the same. It shall be known to most of you as you probably have seen the report. I'm not going into details. Let me that just, just say here that uh, in the validation workshop we have discussed chapters two to five while uh, in, in today's workshop we shall we shall uh, discuss the, the approach uh, to chapters six and seven, namely to the future landscape analysis to be done over the next few months. So uh, I, I said that the major contributions 
uh, came uh, either by, by desk studies or, or the help from related projects, but uh, the major contribution came through something which we call the country sheet. We have collected a certain seven of them. Most of the member states have contributed. Uh, all the associated countries have contributed and we have gathered also two other inputs. Uh, the, 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 the problem with these country sheets is that is, these country sheets are really uh, snapshots which uh, uh, collect information for, for, for a given time and therefore needs to be uh, regularly updated in order to provide a sufficient input for the, for the analysis. Uh, this shall also be eventually a part of our discussion because we, we certainly will be asking the member states and associated countries to, to keep the information in these country sheets up to date and eventually we can think about extending uh, the questions in those country sheets if we uh, see that as needed for the future and this is one of the major outcomes of the validation workshop already is that it would be good to 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 keep uh, this information flux this 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 this, this uh, uh, informations on the, the level of, of policies, infrastructures and, and other activities in the uh, member states up to date and therefore one should think about a landscape dashboard and in addition to that it would be good to, to monitor the progress made in the, in the uh, EOS implementation but this are parts for, for other discussion. So uh, what is uh, the report about? I mean, uh, it is really a quite huge compendium of, of information that can serve as a reference. We, 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 we had to make a compromise between the, the size and the content of, of the report and we decided that we will really focus on collecting the informations on infrastructures, on projects, on strategic documents, on policies, on databases, on resources. We will reference them so that they can be in a way uh, identified and uh, the, the, the information uh, that they contain is then uh, just provided or indicated and, and the link is provided so that it can be found. Uh, we, we have uh, unified the description of all the 50 EOSC-related projects. You can find them in Annex 1, while in Annex 2 you, you find the, the current version of the, the uh, already referred to country sheets. Uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in course of preparation of this report, we have been several times in asking for feedback uh, from the executive board from the governance board and as said we have had a uh, very recently a validation workshop where we discussed on it on the content uh, in the next few slides i will just briefly indicate uh, what we have taken from the validation workshop uh, the the full content of, of the, of the uh, validation workshop, all the comments and so on are not yet incor fully incorporated into the report. We, we are working on that. Uh, we, have, we have at the moment uh, taken on board all the comments coming from the member states. We have identified uh, those issues which can and shall flow directly to this report and uh, we are categorizing uh, the remaining uh, inputs trying to understand how to best incorporate them into the report. The major uh, contributors and participants are listed here. And uh, just straight away, uh, let me show you some inputs from the validation workshop in order to demonstrate mainly that there is a very broad variety of, of issues that has, have been discussed, that there were inputs 
which uh, came as very very complex complex proposals not all of them have been or can can be tackled solely by the landscaping working group but somehow uh, as we are one of the of the uh, executive board working groups we will find a way how to pass them over uh, to the to the uh, working group for which those comments might eventually be more relevant and we will uh, discuss uh, all the all the contributions which came in uh, through the validation workshop with the executive board uh, next week so uh, just to illustrate that even so we did a quite huge effort uh, there was still an impression that several uh, stakeholders in particular uh, some, some some data providers and eventually the users are not sufficiently well described in the in the report we will we will work on that uh, we will we will do also a better effort to to cross cross reference with other information sources so i think that uh, most most of the information is there but we will make more 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 stronger links to some of the uh, let's say pan european activities like the eirg uh, there were many many comments related to national initiatives and you will see that in the in the upcoming slides i hope that part of these issues can be tackled in the in the analytical part uh, in the in the chapters six and seven on which we will work together with dcc in in the next weeks uh, we will we will try really to describe better the diversity of countries and and eventually highlight some good practice examples and and describe the development in the individual member states in a bit more formative way uh, i am i'm not very sure that uh, we can we can go to such an level of details that we really really uh, describe something which is a bit more related to the to the fair working group or or to the architecture working group but we will do some effort and align with the colleagues in in those groups and and try to to do uh, the best we can in in the time we have to our disposal uh, there were quite strong re requests in evaluating the contributions of the of the member states i mean this is something which is rather relevant as a request from the scientific community but on the other hand we feel that uh, at the moment the evolution in national uh, policies and at the national level is such a dynamics that we are running into danger uh, that we are not describing equally the situation and therefore we, we we will we will in very close collaboration with the with the governance board uh, representing the member states and associated countries try to uh, work on the analytical part of of the report such that it's most up to date uh, but still allows allows for some evolution and uh, we are uh, really very aware of the danger that if we create too rigid descriptions uh, it would be uh, not not uh, moving us forward in the way we we wish so uh, the policy and description and description of 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 uh, the evolutions and developments in in the member states will be subject of the landscape analysis and we will we will use the comments which came uh, in the validation workshop uh, asking for some some 
KPIs for some monitoring, uh, for, 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 for some follow-up. We will use that and, and try to let it flow in into the strategic research agenda, which is another document. The executive board is working on that. And together with the sustainability working group, we are providing, providing input to this very important document. There were other requests as you, as you see them, uh, and there were some uh, general uh, considerations. Uh, we are trying to uh, incorporate them straight away because we feel those so uh, very general are also quite relevant. So we decided on spot that we will provide an additional annex to the report where we would include some uh, COVID-19 related initiatives. We will, we will respect the proposed changes in, in chapters three and five. So we will move it much closer to the, to the, to the structures which are used and proposed by, by other organizations, in particular EIRG. We will, we will uh, ask the, the, the governance board to, to consider updating uh, before summer the country sheets so, so that the analytical part works with the most recent data. Uh, we will think how to, how to uh, better explain how to read the report so that it is uh, of, of better use. And uh, we will discuss in the, in the working group the compromise to be made with respect to the length. Because of course, if you have uh, two contradicting uh, notions, one asking for a shorter readable report and the other one uh, just, just adding information to that, you have you have to find a compromise and by that very short introduction i give over to john thank you thanks so thanks jan and and thanks for that uh good status update of where we where we stand today uh, i'm going to now try to show my slides uh with some forward questions So I'll talk about next steps and introduce the discussion. And then our intention is uh, that many of the questions that I pose will be answered interactively, as many as possible, uh, through the Slido feature uh, once we, um, we move to the discussion phase. So the next steps, as Jan has outlined, were uh, already agreed. Um, we are in an iterative process of updating and improving the landscape report with input from many stakeholders, but especially uh, through the validation workshop. We are adding additional analysis, which will be carried out um, by um, consultants, and we'll hear from uh, Joy Davidson about that. The analysis is meant to mean um, drawing conclusions from the state of play that we have analyzed in the country sheets, and maybe, uh, though we need to be careful here, maybe making recommendations for how we would like to see things evolve. I think the landscape report is a status report, but it is in the context of movement towards an open science cloud. Uh, and if we can see any barriers or, or problems, we should identify them uh, and make sure they, are, they appear somewhere uh, in the work of the executive board. Uh, as you heard, we'll have a second validation workshop after the summer. Now, all of this needs to be understood in the context of the existing EOSC executive board, governance board, and oversight systems. So all of these will expire at the end of this calendar year. And so the work of the working group will end at that point by, by definition. Um, we are working in the executive board to make sure that a proposed new EOSC legal entity, the um, 
uh, not-for-profit association that is proposed will be set up and ready for a smooth transition. So when we think about maintaining and continuing to monitor the data that has been gathered in the landscape working group, it is uh, presumably part of the role of that EOSC legal entity association um, to carry that work forward beyond January 2021. So we are interested uh, in refining, updating and receiving input on the report itself. Is the information in the report correct? Uh, is it complete? So the country sheets uh, need to be uh, verified and checked and maybe additional information could usefully be added to the country sheets. Uh, and there may well be other aspects of the European landscape that should be added. Jan already talked about uh, stakeholder perspectives that may not have been captured sufficiently, though it is very hard for a landscape report um, to do justice uh, to the many thousands of individual researchers across Europe who uh, will be the content providers uh, of, of the EOSC. Uh, the report will be completed at the end of this year by definition, as I said, and I think there is a general feeling that the report is useful and it would be more useful if it became a regularly updated uh, monitoring tool. Uh, and I assume then that the EOSC Association uh, would need to be responsible for that. But the resources to do that uh, would have then to be, to be provided. The map on the right hand side is just, of course, one of many that you will find in the report. And it shows the, the interesting data that has been gathered uh, in the country sheets uh, and we're looking forward to the analytical um, uh, contributions, the analytical section that will, that will draw conclusions from this. But already just from, uh, from the patterns that you can see here, uh, you can see that there are, there are many countries which have already started on this journey towards open science and, and fair data, while others are planning uh, to put such policies in place. So the landscape report can be refined and, and will be, and can be improved and will be, but it also highlights some of the questions that uh, the EOSC itself faces. And these have started to come up already in the validation workshop of the landscape report. Uh, those are not necessarily questions that can be answered within the report, but they are conclusions to be drawn from the report or questions that EOSC itself needs to answer. So I think already we can say the landscape report has started to um, stimulate thinking and to raise issues that need to be addressed. So uh, even though we don't have the full analysis uh, in place, it is clear from what is already in the report and what we already know um, from our involvement in the e-infrastructure world. The, the investment from the member states and associated countries in e-infrastructure and services that have the potential to become part of the broader EOSC ecosystem greatly exceeds that that will come through the EOSC partnership or from uh, EOSC um, funded activities in Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe, even though those investments will be substantial. So the EOSC can only achieve its full potential if those national uh, investments and research infrastructure investments become part of the system or become accessible through the system. And there is a, a question then about to, to what extent um, does uh, an e-infrastructure need to become a part of the system in order to become accessible through the system? And that's maybe a, a technical question at some level, but it's also a governance question. Uh, I should also have added that the EOS can only achieve its full potential if the individual researchers uh, and the research infrastructures that will generate, host, and curate the data uh, become part of the ecosystem and become accessible through the ecosystem in the same way. We can also see that policy development towards open science is moving forward across Europe. And in fact, some of the inputs that we've received in the validation workshop uh, are not corrections so much as updates um, to the situation as it was one year ago, noting that new policies are under development and new initiatives have been started. But so far, I think the journey towards open access to publications is further advanced 
than the journey towards open, fair data and services. And that's fair enough, that's reasonable, the conversation has been going longer, but it shows that um, we need to ask more than just, is there a policy for open science, but we need to talk about fair data and access to the services uh, to use it. So finally, uh, many of these issues then point to uh, questions that I don't think the landscape working group can by themselves answer, but that the EOSC governance needs to have good answers to, and we're going to come back to these interactively during the discussion. But there is a whole hierarchy of um, questions about the motivation uh, to become part of this ecosystem, especially because the governance that is being proposed now is very um, bottom up and somewhat uh, voluntary in its nature. The EOSC Association is unlikely uh, to have any powers uh, to do more than advocate, encourage, to set standards uh, and to monitor um, the application of those standards. Um, so we need to provide a system where there is a motivation for individuals to act in a way that builds the EOSC. Uh, in the same way that individuals have acted in a way that makes the World Wide Web uh, as useful as it is today. Uh, individual researchers need a clear motivation to produce their data in a fair format, even though that may um, in the short term impose more work upon them. Uh, it will increase the usefulness and the application of that data. Um, these data then need to be made accessible through the EOSC system, through EOSC portals and findable, um, not just uh, through domain specific tools, but through EOSC uh, systems. Uh, the e-infrastructures, the um, computer systems, data centers, the, uh, um, the investments in computational infrastructure that will form the storage and compute resources needed to use those data also need uh, motivation to either become part of or accessible through EOSC. And we need, uh, or there needs to be some motivation for research performing, research funding organizations, uh, and maybe even a broad range of organizations on the long tail of, um, of research to join the EOSC Association, the legal entity, uh, in order to ensure that a single set of standards and a single way of working uh, is applied across Europe, and we don't end up with multiple uh, competing approaches to, to open and fair data. Now, these go way beyond the scope of the landscape report itself, but now that we have a report um, which, which starts to lay out the structure uh, of investments in um, open science and uh, potentially uh, available for EOSC across Europe, I think these questions start to become interesting. And as I said, some of them were already raised at the last uh, validation workshop. So those can, we can come back to those in the, uh, in the discussion session. Uh, so that is all from me. Um, Jan, do you want to move to Joy next, or do you want to start the discussion? I think it would be good if we uh, have the presentations first, and then we can have a discussion so that we keep also with time. Okay, there have been a couple of versions of the agenda circulating. So, Sarah, um, we'll save those questions then for the discussion, and I'll invite Joy uh, to start sharing her screen, if we can do that. I think we had a little technical hitch earlier yeah we did um i will try to share my screen um and if not i will um, ask one of you maybe to to pick up and do it um hopefully you can see my screen just now yes we can joy thank you I'm great gonna... excellence um well i'm just going to take about five minutes really to go through very quickly um a couple of things so first of all i just wanted to say thank you to yan and john for allowing the dcc to have a few minutes today um, to, to add to this discussion. Um, let me put my screen on slideshow mode. Uh, so I just wanted to start by saying just a couple of things about who we are as the DCC. Um, some of you may already know us. Um, the Digital Curation Center is based in the UK, a, a partnership between the Universities of Edinburgh and Glasgow. We run the DMT online. 
uh, data management planning service that is used by many research performing organizations and also in a national context in some member states. Um, we've been appointed to start the analytical part of the landscape report um, work. Um, this is actually the first day that uh, we're starting and it will run roughly to the end of September and it's approximately 30 days of work that we'll be doing. Um, one of the, the things that uh, I think gives us a good understanding of the, the landscape um, is the fact that we're currently involved in the Ferris Fair project, which is another infra EOSC uh, activity. Uh, we're involved in several of the Research Data Alliance working groups um, and RDA Europe. And in addition to that, we're also part of several of these new uh, EOSC 5B related task force. So I've, I've put a couple in there that you can see. So we're hoping that this will help to give us a bit more um, context and understanding of the, the, the area as we start this new bit of work with uh, the landscaping working group. So the people who will be involved in doing the work, uh, myself, uh, Joy Davidson, my colleagues, Lourdes Wainstotter and Ryan O'Connor. So it'll be starting pretty much from now and, and going to the next few months. Um, so as Jan was saying earlier, uh, the aims for this next bit of the work are really trying to focus on kind of pulling together all of that really useful information in the report as it stands now, um, but really trying to pull out uh, the, the policy related angles. Um, I think that was the key motivation is to try and get um, something that would be useful for policymakers and to try and focus on something that would be um, easy to read and easy to digest. As, as Jan mentioned, the report is very lengthy at the moment, um, lots of good information. So it, it will be trying to figure out how we can make this concise and easy to read and easy to navigate. Um, as I mentioned, this common thread of the open science policies is something we've been asked to focus on. Uh, considerations on MS, uh, the member state readiness to participate in the OSC is also something that we're looking at. And as we'll come back to a little bit later, uh, this is certainly one of the areas that we think will be most difficult. Um, there's, there's the least amount of information that we have to work on in this part of uh, the scope of the, the study. Uh, and the last point, which Yen and John both mentioned, um, there has been some thinking about coming up with either examples of good practice or coming up with pragmatic recommendations. So we will need to kind of come to uh, an understanding of, of what it is we're, we're looking to present at the end. It's certainly good practice, but whether we can take it forward in as much as uh, practical recommendations is something that we'll, we'll decide as we go on. To start the work, um, we will be picking up very much where the T6 consultancy group, who has been working with uh, the landscape group so far, and also with the 5B projects to try and get the landscaping analysis work that they've done more joined up and comparable. So we will be um, getting the raw data from the country sheet. Um, we understand that they are in varying stages of completeness. Some are more complete than others. And um, as we heard in Jan's talk uh, and John's talk, there, there may be updates that come and we'll need to work out how to get these updates into the, the analysis and to work out you know, how, how best to do that. Um, we also need to work with uh, the T6 consultancy consultancy company um, just to get a sense of what survey data is coming from the 5B projects. Many of them have done some landscape analysis uh, surveys and open consultations. Um, some of that will be coming to us and others may not be ready in time, so we need to work out with that. And finally, we're, we're working with the uh, landscape task force, um, the landscape working group, and the governing board just to try and figure out any other additional information and uh, Sessions like the, the validation workshop and this uh, session should hopefully also help us to identify anything else that we might need to look at. So I just wanted to again come back to some of the, the activities that we're going to be doing over the next four months. Um, just to say that today is actually the first day of us starting the work. So uh, from May 18th through to the end of September or possibly the start of October when the second validation workshop uh, will take place. Um, we'll have a roughly about 30 days of effort um, spent trying to do the analytical part. Um, our aim is to try and have some initial first draft, and, and this is likely going to be more around the structure of the report and how to, to get the information 
in um, that easy to read and digestible format. So we'd, we'd be looking to get some sort of agreement on that by mid-June with some initial uh, fleshing out. Um, as I said, we'll also be involved in trying to think about planning the second validation workshop. And uh, we were lucky enough to be able to take part in the first validation workshop and very much looking to, to bring back some feedback on, on what could be improved from that uh, approach for the second uh, workshop at the end of September or beginning of October. So as I said, we're really kind of at the early stages of, of our work on this, um, day one. Uh, but we have been thinking really about how we might start to structure the analysis so that it could be more useful. Uh, one of the things we have been thinking about, and this is where we'd really like to come back and get your feedback um, when we move on to the discussion section uh, of this a little bit later, is whether something like the DCC's research data management service model might be useful. Um, as you can see on the screen, um, it covers many of the things that are in the current landscape report. Um, this was something that we developed out of our curation lifecycle model, and uh, the links to both are on the screen if you want to have a little bit more uh, of information about either. Um, but it very much kind of looks at the entire life cycle of, of how people carry out research and what sorts of things have to happen at different points. Um, all of these, we think, map well to the various different infrastructure components that need to be in place. Um, one of the caveats we, we probably have to say here is that we came up with this model very much um, from a research performing organization point of view. Um, and that this is something that we've generally tended to use with institutions. So whether they're um, higher education institutions or research performing organizations, we've been looking at it very much at that level. Um, but I do think it scales up uh, and it would be something that could be considered either at a national, uh, a regional, or an international level. So that's one of the key things we'd really like to get from uh, you today is, is whether this sort of a structure might be useful. Um, the other thing to, to bear in mind is that there could be very many different people offering something at each stage of, of the diagram, if you like. So it may not all happen in one place. There may be bits and pieces happening at the local institutional level, there may be parts offered by um, S3s or other uh, research infrastructures. Uh, there could be national shared services. Um, there may also be things offered by specific funders or publishers, and there will be different domain-specific repositories. So we would need to try and think about how we present all of this, but we, we think this might be a, a useful framework for us to start to, to progress a little bit. Um, so as I mentioned, we, we will have a couple of questions later on about this particular model and we just very much appreciate your feedback on it. The other thing I just wanted to pick up on uh, before we move on to the discussion, uh, I mentioned earlier we've been asked to focus largely on the uh, open science policies as we move forward. Um, John mentioned that we, we've seen much greater movement towards open access publishing policies across Europe. And we'd like to see that kind of same level of, of formalization uh, with regards to open science. Uh, what we're proposing to put forward as a possible starting point for this is um, based on some work that we've been doing with Spark Europe, uh, which is um, every six months we come up with a, an updated analysis of open science policies in Europe. And these are usually done at the national level. Um, we released our latest version of that just last month, I believe it was, um, or February 2020, sorry. Um, and in that version, we actually introduced for the first time a more structured way of looking at the policies. And that structure was built upon some work that we did in Fair is Fair um, as part of Work Package 3, which was looking at the policy landscape in, in relation to Fair. Um, you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, we had come up with uh, a lot of elements. It was 42 elements, actually, that we looked at in, in terms of what might be included in a policy. Um, for the Spark Europe update, we actually narrowed that down to 10. So I, I think that will be something that we're looking to um, liaise with the, the working group and other stakeholders in the coming uh, weeks, just to kind of pin down uh, which set of elements might be useful and again, the, the links are there, so if anybody wants to have a look and to provide some feedback, we'd be very grateful. Uh, the other thing to, to maybe pick up on here is that we see the structured analysis 
of the policies as being very much um, instrumental if we ever do want to move more towards a dashboard style approach. Um, that was something that came out of the, uh, the, the validation workshop is that for the information in the landscape uh, report and the various country sheets to be useful, um, some sort of a dashboard would be a, a useful way to do it. So this, we hope, might be one of the ways to try and start that process of, of making this stuff um, visualized. The last one I, I just wanted to pick up here, this is uh, very much uh, a question rather than uh, much that we have to offer at this point at this point in time. Um, and this is on assessing readiness for joining EOSP. And we've heard uh, various different discussions over the course of today from the rules of participation group, which I joined earlier, um, a little bit from the sustainability group. Um, to the best of my understanding, there isn't currently a framework on how to assess whether uh, a research performing organization or indeed a member country uh, or member state could be deemed ready to join EOSC or not. Uh, there is a very big tension from what I can see between trying to be inclusive and having lots of um, uh, components being able to, to come in and build the EOSC, but then trying to make sure that there is good quality and that there is some level of sustainability. So uh, we have questions really about how much should the rules of participation uh, feed into assessing readiness? Um, does something like being on a national roadmap have to factor into it in terms of longer term sustainability? Um, so we do have some questions. Um, what we would suggest is again, um, based on that research data management service model, which we showed you earlier, what we could do um, in terms of thinking about readiness is at least try to give a flavor of what is available in each of the member states with regards to each of the components in our model. And, and that might be a good starting point for then saying, um, once these things are in place, then how do we start to assess whether um, they're actually ready to join EOSP? So there, there are some questions that we have really as to um, how to progress that particular area of the study. So some feedback there would be uh, really useful for us. So I think that's basically all we have now. Um, we do have some questions that we'll ask um, after uh, in, in the general discussion session. So I think at this point I'll just hand back to John so that we can start that process. Thank you, Joy. Thanks. Can you uh, stop sharing? And Sarah, perhaps you put up the Slido questions? Yeah, sure. So I just wanted to come back to a couple of points which have been raised in, in the chat. Um, there, were, there were quite a few questions while Joy was speaking um, about how we assess uh, EOSC readiness of the member states, but I think at the end you acknowledge that's an area where we would like, um, well, we still have work to do and maybe it doesn't make sense to capture um, the whole of Germany at a single state of readiness uh, when there are um, there is a readiness of the funders, there is a readiness of researchers, there's a readiness of individual Helmholtz centers and, and so forth. So the, um, we, the granularity may not be uh, sufficient there. Um, we should also, uh, there was also a question about connections of uh, EOSC to countries outside of Europe and outside the associated countries of Horizon Europe. Uh, and I think that's an open area where we, we understand that we need to ensure uh, that science is global uh, and that we're not creating new barriers um, to participation, but we don't want to proceed at the speed of the slowest, um, the slowest region in the world here. So uh, Europe is prepared uh, to take a lead as long as our standards are open and transparent and clear. Uh, and we are quite happy to interoperate with, with other, uh, other science clouds around the world. So the, um, the first question uh, in the poll is, is now up, um, which is uh, one of those that I, I uh, posted. What is the motivation for individual researchers or maybe for research performing organizations uh, to produce data in a, in a fair format? So Sarah, how would, you, how, how would you like to use the polling feature here? So I think either people, so people should enter their answers in Slido or, I mean, as uh, we have only 15 minutes left, maybe I suggest that uh, if anybody wants to comment, they raise their hand and maybe we get their answers lively. Maybe it's 
quicker? Why don't we try that? So I'm not sure where to see the hands raised. Uh, Patricia has entered an answer. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. That's a good one. Yeah. Patricia wants to speak. So uh, let's give, can we, Patricia, yeah. please do. Patricia? You can speak now if you want. Okay, maybe not. Uh, anybody else want to, to give an answer here? I would say that this is in fact the simplest question of our list um, because there is a strong incentive for individual researchers uh, to make their data uh, as widely, um, you know, to propagate the results of their work as widely as possible. This has always been recognized as part of carrying out science uh, and reproducibility, transparency, the ability of others to verify the work uh, will be greatly aided by that. And for research performing organizations, um, a measure of success, a metric of success is the uh, the uptake of the data which is made available. So, okay, reproducibility has appeared uh, quite a lot. But I think individual scientists, um, uh, we, we may start to see people noting somehow in, in their CV uh, the accesses that have been made to their data in the same way that citations of their articles uh, become, have become uh, part of, of, of what you talk about for your research reputation. Uh, Sarah, shall we go on to question two? Yeah, I would say so. So if you, if you make your data fair, uh, why, why should EOSC be the preferred uh, access mode? Uh, why, why would you not uh, design your own system or, or simply um, share it with members of your own research community? What, what is the added value uh, through EOSC? So do we have any hands raised? No, not at the moment. Okay, let me add an answer of my own, uh, just in, in case we, we forget it. Um, it should save you a lot of work. Uh, I, I would hope that doing it through EOSC is simple, easy, and doesn't require writing a lot of software. Um, if that's not true, uh, then EOSC needs to keep working on uh, on those aspects, because uh, we're, we're investing money uh, through Horizon 2020 uh, in projects which should deliver um, a set of tools and a set of standards. If those standards are not easy to use, then then we failed. Uh, so yeah, safety and easy to use, and and the individual research organization should not need to develop and write its own software stack uh, to do this. Yeah, single point of access is a very good point. Um, more data could compare with, yep, data adds value uh, by being part of a large repository. Uh, ability to monitor, yes, citations can be monitored in this, in this framework. Critical mass of users, yeah, no point uploading your data where there are no users. I don't think access through uh, EOSC should be, um, uh, should prevent access through other mechanisms. I don't think you are handing your copyright over uh, to EOSC, um, but the standards should be uh, clear and simple to use and therefore attractive in themselves. Yeah, we've got a lot of answers here. That's good. 15 answers already. Very good, thank you everyone. And people are putting stuff in the chat also. Okay, very good. Uh, next question then, Sarah. Now, this is more for the owners or responsible organizations for e-infrastructures, uh, not so much for the, uh, the, the creators of the data, uh, but for the managers of the, of the data centers or the computer centers. Um, what is the motivation to federate those or to uh, make those, um, those resources accessible, not just the, the data to be, uh, to be used, but the compute cycles to be accessed through 
EOSC. So somebody says sustainability. I think that only applies if there is a financial return, right? So that is, um, that is a good point. There needs to be um, uh, a way of accounting for this provision of resources uh, in kind uh, to, to EOSC. So I think all of these answers are great, great ones. Thank you, everybody. I think these are all answers that we should pass over to the sustainability working group uh, of the executive board, um, because we, uh, we need to make sure that it, this is not a charitable donation to EOSC, um, that the, the resources are recognized either by the national funders or by the European Commission. Um, if, if making things part of EOSC uh, is, is to deliver greater sustainability, that sustainability needs to be linked um, and, not, uh, and not simply hoped for. Yeah, the benefits to the individual researcher are clear. Um, the benefits to the owner and operator of the infrastructure need to be equally clear. Okay, shall we go to the next question? Again, we've generated quite a lot of input here. Thank you, everyone. And then finally, this is very much for, um, for organizations, maybe individual research institutes, maybe individual universities, maybe alliances of universities, maybe funding agencies, or even ministries. Why should they be part of the EOSC association, the, the legal entity going forward? Why should they be part of the governance structure of this ecosystem. So we only have one, one person, only one person has uh, dared to give an answer here. Uh, I would say something about being part of setting the standards. Yes, that's, that's just popped up. Um, I think it's also, we should imagine that the legal association will somehow own the definition of what is the EOSC, uh, the standard setting, but also the way it evolves, the way it changes, the way that um, sustainability is defined and, uh, and success is defined and the monitoring of it. Influence the future development, exactly. Uh, and, and perhaps influence the future funding streams in Horizon Europe. Yeah, and, and to, uh, as we said, to, to ensure a balanced perspective. Um, if you were a, uh, um, you, you would not want the entire governance to be dominated by research organizations from one research field or uh, only from large countries or to have uh, nobody from the arts and humanities represented at the table uh, because the, the, the way that data is treated in different communities may be, may be sufficiently different. Yeah, so we've, got, we've now got 17 suggestions there. Uh, and we have five minutes before the end. So, uh, Sarah, was that the last of our questions or do we have a couple more? So we have some questions from Joy, I guess. Let's just go to those quickly. Yeah, I think um, I would say maybe if we can skip to the, the final question, that would be the best. Okay. Over to you, Joy. Yeah. So, uh, sorry if you had the last sentence to you. <laughs> and so this this is the one I was really kind of looking to get was um, the one that you just went past, sorry, the second to last. Okay, so the, the slide bars, the previous slide. Yeah. Um, and essentially, the, the question really is, you know, when we're thinking about EOSC readiness, um, it was trying to understand what really should shape that. Um, what do we have now that we might be able to use? Um, so I mentioned 
you know, we, we have things already taking shape like the draft rules of participation. Um, technology readiness levels are something that are already used and people are very familiar with, especially in the European Commission context. Um, in the S-Freeze, um, being included on national roadmaps is, is something, again, that we're, we're quite familiar with. Um, sustainability, which I see is taking a, a big lead, actually, um, surprisingly. Um, I know that the Commission is similarly doing some work on um, sustainability of research in, uh, infrastructures. So uh, how many of these things really do we need to be thinking about? Um, the other question, and maybe if we have just a couple of minutes. Um, would <laughs> yeah, be, go ahead. <laughs> just to say, who should be assessing readiness? Um, just one of the kind of questions that always um, comes to my mind is, is who makes these decisions about who's ready? Um, would this be a sort of a self-assessment for people wanting to join? Um, or is it something that happens at the member state level? Or is it something that happens at the EOS governance level? So there, there's lots of uh, things I think we need to think about. So it's interesting to see uh, technology readiness levels and sustainability neck and neck. Interestingly, the draft rules of participation <laughs> are, <Yeah>. are <laughs> plummeting down <laughs> a little bit, um, which well, that may be interesting. <laughs> yeah, that may be because those are seen as a technical. Um, the assumption is that those do exist, and it's more about willingness and readiness and uh, having a sustainable funding route. Uh, I think some of the draft rules of participation touch on the policy angles as well, you know, about yeah. open access yeah. and things like that. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, now you've mentioned it, that's clicking up <laughs> in popularity. Right. I know it's interesting. So, For sustainability and, and technology readiness levels, then definitely we'll, we'll have a look at some of these things. Um, as things we could start to make some assessments on, on readiness uh, as a starting point. So that's been really useful. Uh, so thank you very much. Yeah. I, I see we're one minute to the end, so I'll-, I'll Right, thank you. Um, no, that's, that's great. And fortunately, I didn't have any long and detailed conclusion to draw from this, um, except to say that we're, on an inter we're at an interesting point um, in the, the EOSC journey. Um, we've, We've done quite a lot of work, as, as you've seen, in trying to capture the current state of play uh, across Europe and the associated countries uh, as, uh, as there is a bottom-up movement towards open science and open data. And the, the goal of EOSC is to kind of capture the energy that is coming uh, in this bottom-up discussion, um, but focus it on a single set of standards and a single set of systems and a single sustainability model. Um, so that we don't go through a kind of a VHS versus Betamax um, argument over, over the best way to, to make data fair. Uh, and the Commission is willing to put significant additional resources into the system uh, in order to achieve that outcome. So, so this is a, is a really good confluence of, of bottom-up um, emergence of a, of a movement in the scientific and research communities uh, top-down funding that will enable things to move a little bit faster. Um, and I think the what the landscape group has, has tried to do is capture this, um, this evolution a, as it is happening. Uh, and it will be, it's very important that we, we, we draw the right conclusions from this, but the conclusions are also a way to stimulate and influence the future direction of travel. Um, so for me, up till now, the landscape report has been a description of the world. And now as we start to move into the analysis and thinking about the policies, we start to say how we would like the world to change uh, in order to make EOSC happen. Uh, and so the input today has been extremely interesting and useful uh, in that regard. We know we have to be a little bit cautious in some of these areas because we, we cannot simply uh, tell um, large country governments exactly how they should manage their research. But I hope we can lay out a persuasive case um, that uh, building an EOSC ecosystem uh, that works for all of the, the participants is, is our shared goal. Uh, and this landscape report is a, is a good uh, starting point at describing what that system needs to look like. So thanks very much to everybody who's participated and thanks to all of the, the speakers. And I think we need, to, we need to wrap up. We've had a lot of questions about what can be shared out of this, um, this uh, session. We will share all of the slides. Uh, I, we have shared drafts of the report itself 
um, with a number of key stakeholders, uh, some of you who are in the room, the next draft will be shared much more widely. I, I don't know, Jan, if you want to say any more about that. Um, but we, we do recognize that we, we don't want to share incorrect and incomplete information, um, but we do want to uh, share it more broadly before it's finalized. Uh, so that's all from me. Uh, anything else from you, Jan? No, oh, John, th thank you very much for, for everything. And I agree also with the part you said just now, it would not make much sense to share with you a half-baked report. It will be finalized very soon and then it will be distributed very broadly. Yep. Okay. So uh, we're a couple of minutes late, but thank you very much to everybody for managing this uh, very smoothly. And thanks to the technical team uh, who I hope have made this uh, work for everybody who's been participating. Thank you all. Thank you very much, uh, John and Jan. Uh, so now we break for 30 minutes and uh, the final uh, um, Q&A session starts at 4 p.m. in this uh, Zoom room. So please uh, stay connected here if you want to participate to the final uh, Q&A session. Thanks. <laughs>